about the area of trauma, uh, particularly interpersonal trauma. So there are other forms of trauma that don't involve other people, right? So there's a natural disaster as a trauma. Uh, there is medical trauma. Uh, but then there are interpersonal trauma, which is one person or a group of people harming others. And the intention of interpersonal trauma is to erase you. The intention of interpersonal trauma is to create a narrative that you do not matter, that your voice does not matter, that your body does not matter, that your needs or wants do not matter. And so when we shatter the shame of trauma, we defy those lies and we speak truth that we still have light, that after all that was taken from us, there is a part of us that remained untouched, that there is a part of us that is beyond the reach of perpetrators and abusers. And so I am excited to share with you on today biblical narratives of trauma, looking at spiritual and psychological restoration. And this is personally important to me. It's not just in academic exercise, but often our lives lead us to our research and our lives lead us to our practice. And so I am a trauma survivor. And when I speak about restoration, it is not just something I read in a book. When I speak about the possibility of restoration, healing and transformation, it is something I have lived and that I have been honored to facilitate that process with others. And I do not take it lightly when we are willing to bear witness one with another. So I am excited for this topic. And I want to raise to your awareness, there are different ways that people respond when they see your wounds. When the world sees our wounds, when some church people see our wounds, their response is, what's wrong with you? Right? Why is, why is she talking like that? Why is he acting like that? What's wrong with them? A trauma-informed person sees your wounds and asks a different question. They ask, what happened to you? When you see a child acting a certain way in school, when you see a classmate acting a particular way that does not seem to match the context, a good question to ask is what happened. And often what happened is before this moment. We have often been set up by our life experiences to show up in a particular way. Then there is not only a trauma-informed perspective, but when you are culturally aware and trauma-informed, you ask the question, what happened to you and your people? Because some of us are carrying wounds that are generations in the making. There is a such thing as intergenerational trauma, which some people call ancestral trauma, and it can show up genetically in terms of our bodies responding to trauma and that then being passed down. It can also be passed down through our teaching. So what we are taught in terms of within the Jewish community to never forget, what we are taught in terms of for Armenians to be vigilant because often your stories will be denied and erased, what we are taught in terms of people of African descent people who are American Indian and indigenous are taught some messages directly and indirectly about how to survive. And so when we are culturally aware and trauma informed, it shifts the question that we ask. It shifts the way we see people. And then when you add on to that a faith perspective, how has your faith been shaped by your trauma, and how has your trauma shaped your faith? And in some faith communities, those are not acceptable questions to ask. But I want to create space for us to speak those things that people have hidden in their heart and have been ashamed, have been made to feel ashamed of speaking. What do I mean? 
For example, in my church tradition, there's a song people like to sing. Uh, I woke up this morning and I didn't have no doubt. Right? And they sing, no doubt, no doubt. I didn't have no doubt. Well, when you're a trauma survivor, you might have some doubts. You might have some questions. You might have some, uh, you know, I have some issues that I need to take up with the throne room. And when we have emotionally underdeveloped ministers, they are not comfortable with people's questions and truths. And often it is because they have not looked at their own processes. And so they are not equipped nor prepared to walk us through ours. So we want to start really from that frame. When you look at yourself, when you look at your clients, that the story does not begin with them sitting in front of you. The story began long before that. And so when we start to ask those questions in our minds, we will respond with more compassion, not only to each other, but to ourselves. There is a reason you are the way you are. And if you can have grace and compassion for yourself, the healing can begin. So I'm going to talk today about the different types of interpersonal trauma. I'm going to talk about the potential effects that it can have. I want to highlight for you some of the major themes that, regardless of theoretical orientation, the themes you want to attend to when working with trauma survivor. And I'm aware that not everyone here is a student or clinician, so then these also apply to your personal life. And then uh, to talk about our lack of training in ministry and in the church where we tell people, you don't need to go to anybody else but us but yet we are not equipped or prepared to sit with you. So we shame people for going to therapy, and then we want to just say the Lord's Prayer and send people home. So it is unfair. It is unfair and unethical, and it's not Christ. So we will then look at some biblical narratives uh, that we can use in treatment with Christian clients to walk them through the recovery process or for those who are also here for themselves, can think through these narratives as we process our own healing. There is something very powerful in the story. It is beyond snatching a verse. It allows us to illuminate people's lived experiences and how that rubs up against our encounters with God. And then I will talk briefly about some other things that churches can do. And then we will end with a healing moment because I don't believe it makes sense to talk about healing for two hours and leave the same way you came. So let's prepare first for uh, spending two hours focused on trauma. There is uh, importance of recognizing that the way we respond to trauma is different. And so we have to have an understanding of ourselves and be mindful of taking care of ourselves. So there are those of you who are present who are trauma survivors, who are very comfortable with your story, who have talked about your story, who have processed in some ways your story, and you can kind of breathe through this. And it may remind you of some things, but then you can center back in. Uh, but then there are those who happen to come today who have been running from your own story. And yet, here you are. And I want to offer to you the importance of taking care of yourself. And so the human mind is, is pretty incredible because God designed it that way, that your brain will take care of you. So there is something called dissociation. And dissociation is a mental checkout. It is a disconnection. And especially child trauma survivors who were not able to physically escape may have learned to escape in their minds. So while the trauma is occurring, they are up in the ceiling. While the trauma is occurring, they are out the window up in the stars. And then they return when they can return. So it can help us in moments of emergency, but one of the challenges is if you develop dissociation early, sometimes it happens outside of your will or intention, that when you feel danger or uncomfortable, you might just check out. 
And the reason I name that is if over the course of this lecture, you find yourself daydreaming, it's okay. Your mind is giving you a mental break and a vacation. And when you come back, I'll still be standing here talking. <laughs> so uh, to not uh, judge yourself harshly, if you need to get water, do that. If you need to step out for a minute, do that. Uh, if you are here with a friend and you just need to catch eyes with them, we can do that as well. Uh, because we are in this process, in this holding place together. And I want you to know the way that I have paced it um, is I won't give you a lot of vivid stories of trauma, um, but I will talk more about the impact and how to heal. Uh, because sometimes the vivid stories can be triggering for people. So I want you to at least exhale on that because you're like, what is this about to be? You can breathe on that. And uh, we want to establish community. So if you can just turn to the person next to you and say, I'm so glad you came today. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so we have our self-care, we have our community care, and then we also have Holy Spirit care. And so for you to be aware that God is present with us, and so if you start to feel uh, overwhelmed or distressed, and let me say something for those who uh, find themselves tearful, uh, tears are a gift. And what I like to say is, your tears are prayers. Your tears are prayers. There are some things we have no words for. So if your tears need to speak for you, let them come. If we can take inhale and exhale. So there are different types of interpersonal trauma. Uh, one of them is child abuse, and there are different types of child abuse. So there is physical child abuse, there is verbal and psychological, emotional child abuse, there is sexual abuse, and there's also neglect. And I want you to know there is no hierarchy on trauma. That sometimes we say, well, I should be over it because other people had worse experiences than me. But the reality is violation is violation and neglect is neglect. When we look at this issue of integration of spirituality and psychology, the integration of church and mental health, then we have to recognize also in this realm of child abuse that often churches have done a disservice to children. That many churches have preached sermons about the necessity of beating your children and have never spoken about the reality of child abuse and not just as a joke, not just something that the children these days run and tell. And so they demonize children and make it that the holy thing to do is to whoop and beat and brutalize children. And if we are honest, all of us know an adult that has crossed the line. And if you don't know an adult that has crossed the line, you might be the adult that has crossed the line. And so we want to be mindful about our charge, our spiritual and psychological charge of being caretakers and protectors of children. Not only do we have the realities of child abuse, and I can see some people holding their breath, breathe, breathe. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. And this here is sanctuary. And as opposed to our past experiences, sanctuary is where people actually tell the truth. So even when it's uncomfortable, the truth does actually lead to our freedom. So sometimes you have to then adjust, how is it that I can relate to these people if I really acknowledge what happened? That's the part that's disruptive. Because when we have tucked it away or justified it, we can continue to sit there like nothing happened. But when we acknowledge the truth of our experiences, 
often there is a reordering and a realignment that has to take place. Not only do we have the issue of child abuse, but we also have sexual assault and being aware of sexual assault that there are different types of perpetrators of sexual violence. And if you're going to work with offenders, you need to understand the mindset of the offender that you are working with. So there are some perpetrators of sexual assault who are opportunists. And an opportunist predator knows that if it were not for this circumstance, I would not have this opportunity, so I'm going to seize the opportunity. What does that look like? It looks like the person who waits to see who's the most intoxicated at the end of the night and offers to walk them home. This is my opportunity. This is the one who sees someone in the common area of a dorm who has fallen asleep and comes and puts their hands on them. It's an opportunity, right? So in their mind, they are aware, if it were not for this opportunity, I would not have this chance. There is another category of perpetrator that is uh, an arrogant perpetrator who sincerely believes everybody wants them. Authentically. So they're not looking for an opportunity. Those are the ones who say to me, well, Dr. Tama, when women say no, they don't really mean it. And so then when I say, well, how would you know if someone really meant no? And the person laughed and said, I could just tell. So it is up to their decision making, no matter what you're saying, no matter what your tears are doing, any of that doesn't matter because deep down, I'm really so wonderful and so awesome and so incredible, you must want me. And then the third category of offender, which is less common, is the offender who is actually aroused by your discomfort. So it's not just that I think you want me, I know you don't, and that is what makes it enjoyable. Take a breath. So if we are going to do this work, you can't approach it with a cookie cutter. You have to actually understand the thinking of the person you're talking to so that transformation can take place. Not only do we have sexual assault, we have human trafficking, both sex trafficking and trafficking for labor. We have intimate partner abuse. Abuse by partners that is not only physical or sexual, but also psychological. A lot of people have now talked about narcissistic abuse. There's also the reality of community violence, school violence, war, and societal trauma. So societal trauma is oppression. Did you know that classism can be traumatic? That racism can be traumatic? That heterosexism and sexism can be traumatic? And so the impact of those on our lives are very real. And it is important as clinicians that you start to ask the questions and not to be dismissive of people's experiences. So how does trauma affect us? How has it shown up in our lives? People respond differently. And so if we are expecting people to respond like us, we can miss it. If we judge people harshly for not responding like us, we can miss it. And when we compare children and say, you should be more like them because they're doing fine or they're doing well in school or they're still obedient, you should just be more like them, then we have not taken into account the reality of the child or the adult who is sitting or standing before us. So emotionally, some people respond with depression, which is extreme sadness. It's beyond regular sadness. It's clinical, right? And not only does it uh, show up with depression, it can show up with post-traumatic stress. It can also show up with anger. And let me say this to you. If you're going to be a clinician, you need to become comfortable with people's anger. Sometimes we are only sympathetic towards crying victims. Right? Because that usually, you know, your heart goes to them, right? They're crying, they're sad, they're grateful. Thank you for meeting with me. But how do you respond to the trauma survivor with their arms crossed, their legs crossed, their purse in their lap, and they're giving you a side eye? Can you have grace for them? Or are you dreading your three o'clock? And so we need to know that the anger can really be from a justified and a healthy place because outrageous things have happened. 
I went uh, with a student who was being sexually harassed on a different campus I used to work at, and I went with her to make her report with the administration. And she told them about the stalking and the harassment. And after she left and I stayed in the room, the administrator said, mm, she sure has a bad attitude. It's so problematic. I was so clear if she had sat there weeping, she would have gotten a different response. And that's not on her. Someone is stalking you and harassing you and you're mad about it. And we're the ones that are in a position to make things right. So you are expressing it to us. But when we have not done our own work, when we are not aware and clear, we take things personal that are not personal. Not only that, some people respond with humor. And you want to really be careful when you have trauma survivors who respond with humor because human nature is usually we mimic the affect people give us. That's why at fancy restaurants, they train their waiting staff to ask you questions with a nod. Would you like more wine? Some dessert? Would you like an appetizer? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, I want, I want all of that. That sounds good. <laughs> so mimicry, it is human nature. We mirror each other. And so you have to be careful when you're first starting off as a clinician because sometimes people are telling you a traumatic story and they're smiling. They're telling you a horrible thing and they're laughing, but it is their way of coping to get through the story. So what you want to do is make your face match their content, not their face. Right? So it takes an awareness of yourself and what is happening. For cognitive effects, it can make it difficult for us to focus and to concentrate. You can have trouble remembering things. Behaviorally, people may start harming themselves, uh, cutting, restrictive eating, uh, reenacting the trauma. Uh, and some of them then, not everyone, but some become offenders and are now looking uh, for people with less power than them to act that out upon. Suicidal thoughts, risky behavior, uh, self-sabotaging behavior. If you have not heard the term, there is something called passive suicidality. So passive suicidality is when I would not take my own life, but I wouldn't mind not being here. So I'll drive without the seatbelt on. I'll have unprotected sex with strangers because it really doesn't matter. Like if I'm here or not, it doesn't matter. So we want to be tuned into the behaviors. It also affects our trust. And we can go on various uh, extremes. Some of us trust everyone, everyone immediately and tell them everything. And then there are those of us who know the art of knowing people for years and not letting them know anything about you. That's an art. That's a skill. They, I mean, you've been going to lunch with them all that time and they have no idea who you are. So <laughs> it, uh, some people are obvious in their distrust, you know, so it's written all over their face, leave me alone, I don't want to be bothered. And then some people know how to mask it, so they seem approachable, but you don't actually know them. So our trust gets affected. Some of us are okay with friendship, but not okay in intimacy or romantic circumstances, especially when we're dealing with issues of sexual assault or sexual abuse. So we have to be mindful that sometimes people will spiritualize that effect and say things like, Jesus is my boyfriend. Is he now? <laughs> is, is that what he wanted to be? That's He asked you to be his girlfriend? <laughs> so if we're not tuned in to churchy language, then we can think that people are just religious and we can miss that it's their trauma speaking. Do you know, I'm gonna really mess you up for a minute. Do you know that there are people who it's not really that they're so good at abstinence, it's that they're trauma survivors? Oh, they look so holy. <laughs> like it's not even hard for them because they actually don't want to do it. And then I end up seeing them once they are married and the partner is expecting something and it is hard for them to engage because really it has not been Christ keeping them but the trauma. Okay, so it affects our uh, sexuality. It also affects our spirituality. 
You know, I had a client who said, I'm trying to make sense of things because I was told God is love, God is everywhere, and God is all-powerful. But for me to be molested, one of those must not be true. She said, e either he's not love, or he wasn't there, or he didn't have the power to stop it. So, like, which one is it, right? Now, often in faith communities, that is an unacceptable thing to say. And so we silence people, but they're still sitting with it, or they retreat, right? So we have to create the spaces where people can say things that may be uncomfortable, that push up against uh, our uh, doctrine, that pick, uh, push up against, here's the thing, if you believe in God, God is big enough for our questions. God is big enough for our concerns. God is even big enough for our anger, right? God is not so like tiny that like, ooh, you hurt my feelings, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so we want to really make our space is big enough for people to show up in truths. There are different responses to the sense of danger, um, and you want to start to know what is yours. When you feel unsafe, what do you do? So there are some of us in the automatic mode is fight, right? There are some people that's just, like, there's not something they think about. If they feel you're coming for them, they're going to go in attack mode, and that can be verbally or physically. So sometimes in classes or social situations, when you thought you were at level one and the person went to level 10, they're in fight survival mode, right? That if I shut you down and display the fullness of my rage, you will never bother me again. That's what some people are doing in your offices. And you're like, oh, that's what that is. <laughs> that's what, because it didn't match. It didn't make sense. They are trying to shut you down so you know not to mess with them. So some people go into fight mode, some people go into flight mode. So they're quick to drop out, quick to end relationships, quick to switch programs, quick to switch advisors. Uh, they don't like confrontation and they don't like uh, discomfort because uh, it may end badly. So why don't I just take myself out early? Actually, they might've been planning to come here today and they already left. <laughs> they're like, oh, this, this is trauma trauma. I forgot, I'm supposed to meet a friend, okay. Uh, and then there are those of us who freeze. That's the dissociation or the disconnection. And one of the, as a child, as I said, that can be helpful, but if you're an adult and you're still doing that, it can put you in increased danger because when you sense that people are threatening, you freeze and wait for it to be over. So a part of your therapeutic process becomes learning how to activate in the face of danger. Not only freeze, but what we have talked about more recently in the literature is tend and befriend. Tend and befriend are those whose go-to is to try to make the perpetrator happy, to try to make their abusers like them to do their best to extend themselves to be approved of. It is being a people pleaser, even with people who don't respect you. Because if they are pleased with me, maybe they will treat me better. So before you start thinking about your clients, I invite you to think about yourself, what your go-to mode is, how you usually respond when things feel unsafe. And do we have flexibility to respond differently in different circumstances? There is also complex trauma. Complex trauma is when uh, it was not a single event, but extended over time. So often like child abuse is usually not a single event. Intimate partner abuse is usually not a single event, but it is happening extensively over time. And so it disrupts our sense of ourselves it disrupts our ability to regulate our emotions, and it disrupts our ability to connect and build relationship with others. So it's important to be aware of the various effects that can show up uh, in your clients, in yourself, bless you, in your classes, uh, and in church. Because once you have a trauma-informed lens, 
it will make church much more doable. You know, when you hear people say, I hate church people, have you ever heard that? Church people get on my nerves. Well, <laughs> it is when I'm looking at their behavior in isolation. When I start to know there is a story for the ways that you are showing up disrupting these meetings week after week. <laughs> There's a story there. And then I can shift to respond to my understanding of what that looks like. What could have set people up to show up in the way that they're showing up? So there are themes that we deal with as we're helping people through recovery. And the first piece is safety. We cannot do trauma recovery work with people who are still significantly in danger. What I can do is maintenance and coping. What do I mean by that? It is very different to work with a woman who has escaped an abusive relationship and help her heal versus if I'm doing counseling with a woman who is still with her abuser. It's a different kind of work. So you have to recognize what, what is the state of this person's life. Then we deal with issues of trust, addressing shame and self-blame. It's important to give people permission to mourn their losses. It's also important to give people permission to feel their anger, that anger can actually be a healthy response because often anger is turned inward and manifests as depression and self-blame. So it can be progress when I actually recognize they should not have done that to me. That's progress. So we also look at body image and sexuality, coping, self-esteem, and thriving. There are different models to treatment. Some are focused on our thoughts, some focused on our behavior, some helping people shift the narrative, the story they're telling. Yesterday, we focused on mindfulness, learning how to be present instead of stuck in the past. There's EMDR, use of the expressive arts. So we've been singing and dancing. And then there is psychodynamic, recognizing that my early experiences are affecting the way that I show up, but often it is beyond my awareness. So I have to get tuned into the story I've been telling myself. One of the things that's often left off of trauma stories and trauma recovery is post-traumatic growth. So post-traumatic growth is important because and especially if you come from a spiritual perspective, people were put on the planet to do more than heal from what was done to them. Yeah. Right? Like that whole thing was a detour. So if I help you come from your detour to get back on your path, now like what is your path? What are your gifts? What are your skills? What are your values? What is your heart? What is your purpose? What is your calling? What is your vocation? Now we can get to work. So, uh Authentic, spiritually informed trauma treatment does not end with the cessation of symptoms. Just because you stop cutting doesn't mean you have joy. Yeah. Right? So we want to address the symptoms of distress, but now let's make a life. Right? Now it is time for the process of living. And as you live, you may get still re-triggered sometimes, but then we come back on path and remember who we are, that I am not defined by my trauma, I am not defined by the perpetrator, but I am a sacred being with calling, purpose, and gifts, right? That is who I am. And nothing that was done to me erased that. So it is uh, a radical act of faith therapy, even for atheist therapists, is an act of faith that you have to believe that people can have a better lives than they have right now. And when we look at all the statistics, they're supposed to have all these negative effects. And so how remarkable is it that you live through all that and you're still positive? Amen. How remarkable is it that after everything that happened to you before the age of 15, you came in here with a smile on your face? Yes. I mean, we are actually miracles so if you can just turn to the person next to you and say, you're sitting next to a miracle. <laughs> Tell them, you're sitting next to a miracle. <laughs> My life would not have predicted that I would be this kind, right? That's why it's wonderful when people meet me and say like, oh, you know, you have such a bright smile. You just must have just had like this godly, lovely, wonderful life. I said, I'm glad you think so. 
I'm glad you think so. That's what healing can do. That's what healing, not masking, right? Not masking, because you can feel a mask, right? But authentic healing is not faking it, but actually living it. So let us get into our text. Uh, so there is the story first of Hagar. And often people celebrate Abraham and Sarah, but I have come to celebrate Hagar. And so the first thing that you need to pull from the story of Hagar is that people's life circumstances can increase their risk of trauma. And so her social economic status, her race and ethnicity set her up for marginalization, for violation, and for people in authority to not care, for people in authority to not come and check on her. And so she is an enslaved woman in the Old Testament. Now, one of the painful things you want to pull from this story is, what is the experience of trauma survivors who have a popular offender? Uh, all right. right? Years later, we're like, Father Abraham. Right? What does it mean when they make your offender man of the year? Pastor, come on, call it out. We can call it's sanctuary. We're gonna tell the truth in here. <laughs> what does it mean when people celebrate the person who brutalized you? And so if our sanctuaries do not have space for those in the margins, it is not God's place. We are not reflecting the reality of God. Then we have gaslighting 101. So gaslighting is when people abuse you and then they make it seem like you're the problem or like that you're crazy. So Sarah was getting up in age and was afraid that uh, she wasn't gonna be able to have children. So she told Abraham to impregnate the enslaved woman, Hagar. So if a mistress tells a master to go have sex with an enslaved woman, is that consent? How many times have you heard Hagar preached as a rape story? None. Because we're on the side, and even some of you sitting here now are like me mugging me, trying to make it work in your mind, but I'm not going to stop talking, so I don't care. <laughs> Y'all like, you're not going to talk about Abraham. I sure am. So <laughs> it is not, if consent cannot be denied, it cannot be given. If you are enslaved and you don't get a choice, that is not consent. So here is the amazing thing. After she tells her husband to go sleep with the enslaved woman, then she says that the enslaved woman has a bad attitude. I mean, isn't that some stuff? People will mistreat you, harass you, violate you, and then say, what's wrong with you? Coming in here with your face all turned up like that. Right, that's domestic violence where people beat you and then say, where's breakfast, right? I know you're not gonna sit around crying all day. Yeah. Gaslighting. And then we write it in the text and then people preach it all over the world that Hagar was a woman with a bad attitude. Yeah. We've come to shift the narrative, yeah. right? We've come to tell the truth. It's in the book. It is just for our eyes and ears and heart to actually see her, not see her the way. See, the people in power are the ones who wrote down the story. So now we have to challenge ourselves to look deeper at what really is happening here. Then Hagar ran off, and then she ended up coming back. And you need to know that survivors of intimate partner violence often leave multiple times before they're gone for good. So it's important for us to be patient with people because what offenders count on is we get impatient and tired of people going and coming and going. And then we're like, look, if you're not going to be done with him, I don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> right? We lose our patience with people as they are working through their progress, their process. Uh, it would have been good if she had community, but she was disconnected from her community. And so when people disappear, we want to be the ones that check on people, 
Not just like, oh, they just don't come to church anymore. There might be a reason. They just don't come to class anymore. Instead of just assuming, because this is how faculty will talk, they're not really invested in the program. I know, I've been in the faculty meetings, right? You know, they just, you know, they don't really care. Maybe there's a deeper story. Maybe there's a reason why they keep coming in late or not showing up at all. And it may be that this isn't the right time for them because life is crowding in in other ways. So it also affected her parenting. So when Hagar leaves the second time, she has her son and uh, she sees him suffering. She's struggling. She doesn't have anything for him and she hates to see him suffer. So she sits him down and she looks away. She moves away. How many of you have checked out parents because they have their own trauma? Sometimes the reason why your parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles are not tuned into you is because they are checked out from themselves. So we want to be aware that the trauma affects our parenting, but here is the powerful thing. She is at her wit's end. She's been betrayed. She's been isolated. She doesn't see how she's going to make it. And then God shows up. That there is a positioning in our faith, which is very personal, that even when my therapist doesn't get it, my faith community doesn't get it, my family doesn't get it, there is God. And here's the beautiful thing about God. This woman who is marginalized, God gives her the honor to be able to name God. She is the first person in the Bible to name God the one who sees me. Oh, that name only emerges from someone who knows what it's like to be invisible. When you are used to being seen and entitled and privileged, it would not occur to you that God sees you because, of course, God sees you because you're so amazing. But when you have been erased, when you have been violated, when you have been marginalized, and you become aware that God sees you, that's where the healing starts to happen because clearly... Abraham, when you came in here at night, you did not see me. Sarah, when you directed him to come in here, you did not see me. But God, but God God sees me. And so my aim becomes to see myself through the eyes of God, not the eyes of my offender. When I am walking in shame, it is because I have come to believe the lies that the offender has told me about myself. The offender told me I was worthless and powerless and insignificant, and I have internalized that and walked around believing it until a divine thing happens that can be facilitated with an in-tune therapist, which is to remind you who you are. That is the sacred work, to remind us that the reality is we, our worth is not based in how we have been treated. And that's usually the CBT model, is we tell people, look at the evidence. But what if all the evidence says I'm worthless? Right? You tell me, look at the evidence. This woman mistreated me. This one abandoned me. This one neglected me. This, the evidence shows I am unimportant. But the reality is that the evidence can lie. That how people have treated you does not equal your worth and your value. I want to shift to the New Testament and tell you the story in Luke of the bent over woman. The bent over woman had been in this condition a long time and she couldn't stand. So the important piece for us to take from that is people are not faking it. Right? Family members want you just say like, get out of that bed. Just get, just get up and put your clothes on and go to work right? We act like people could just stand and they're just refusing to stand, but she could not stand. So we want to be careful in our treatments that when we're giving people homework assignments, that I give you something that is a stretch, but that is doable, right? Because if I set it too high, it's like for me, if you had KFC yesterday, today don't turn vegan, 
right? It's too drastic. It's too dramatic, right? You might want to start with like meatless Mondays. You know, work your way up. So when you have someone who is severely depressed and dealing with PTSD, and we give them these assignments that are in another galaxy, right? Taking a shower might be, that might be it. Take a shower. Take a shower. Let's, let's take a shower. Not let's take a shower, but take a shower. <laughs> Not only that, she kept showing up to the temple, which is a reminder to us that our trauma and our wounds are not because we are sinful, right? Some people blame themselves and turn that into God is mad at me. But do you know you can love God and worship God and still struggle? And then even in her condition, Jesus saw her. And that is the importance that we want to, do you really see your clients? Not their performance, not their presentation, not their mask. But when you can get to a place where I can look past all of that and see you, and that's the beauty of when your life experience, if you have ever had to go through life and you were in warfare but couldn't show it, then you know how to recognize that in other people, right? When I'm looking at people who have a smiling face but empty eyes, I know that look, right? And so for me not to just get caught up in the smile, but to see you. So Jesus saw her and called her over in the state of her brokenness, and she came forward. So that is our, our clients have a role in their healing, right? She came to the temple. She stepped forward. She's doing her part. There is a sacred part of healing. There is a human part of healing, and she is doing her part. Jesus speaks to her and he touches her. He gets at her vulnerability and visibility, right? So if I am going to touch, and I mean that emotionally, if I am going to touch a person's heart, I have to actually see them. I have to actually connect with them and I have to extend compassion. And when people are touched, when they are seen, then the shifting can take place. Here's the thing. After Jesus heals her, church people got mad. Isn't that some stuff? Yeah. <laughs> I want you to know some people don't want you well. Some people benefit from your brokenness. Some people benefit from your insecurity. Some people benefit from your silence. That's why I always tell people who are dating, don't date right now when you're super broken. Right? Because some people will fall in love with being your rescuer. And when you heal and have a voice with opinions, they might not like that. They liked carrying you. They didn't like you walking. So you want to be careful with your clients to prepare them for the pushback that some of them will receive when they start healing and being more empowered. Not only that, he speaks to her as a daughter, right? A daughter of the faith. And so our kindness is really based in a human connection that you are not just who I'm seeing at one o'clock, you are not just the next person in the book, but that I really relationally connect with you. Now, when the crowd started uh, raising issues with her healing, here's the beautiful thing. She didn't say a word. Some of our survivors get set back because they try to justify themselves to people that they don't need to explain themselves to. That takes a whole lot of energy and it will spiral you because you're trying to convince them that you're worthy and that you're okay. And the best thing that you can do when you are in the face of someone who refuses to understand you or have compassion is, right? I have nothing to prove. But, did, you know, they'll try, they don't like that, right? They'll try to pull you in. And, but why, why did you think that? Da, da, da? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Look, I'm protecting my energy and my mental health. So if not, you will have clients who week after week come in talking about the new person who set them off. That's what therapy will be. Every week, a new person set me off, right? So then I get to a place where I don't have to fight every battle, and I recognize not everything is drama-worthy. Not everything is drama-worthy. 
When I came last year, I did the my crystal model of trauma recovery. So I'm not going to redo that, but you can take a picture if you weren't here. And it uses the example of Jesus from the crucifixion to ascension and those being steps of healing from tomb time to him going to social support, talking to the women, self-care. Forgiveness is different from reconciliation. So the point I made is he forgave the soldiers, but he didn't hang out with them. Okay. And he showed his wounds, he ascended, and then he came back to serve. And many trauma survivors, and some of you are in here today training to be clinicians, many of you have skipped your own process and have jumped to service. You were traumatized, and now you want to be a therapist. So you need to do your process so that you can do it from an authentic place. I am a trauma survivor. I um, am a trauma survivor of sexual assault. I'm a trauma survivor of the war in Liberia. I'm a trauma survivor of community violence in Baltimore. And I'm a trauma survivor of societal trauma, racism and sexism. And, uh, and God came to see about me. If you are a survivor, I want you to know uh, that your body is a temple and it is a powerful thing for the body that was ignored to be seen. Thank you.